Hi, my name is Rachel Kramer Bussell. I am an erotica anthology editor, author of How to Write Erotica, and editor of Open Secrets magazine. And I also write essays and articles. Okay, so let's just do the lightning round to kick things off. So okay. when did you first identify as a writer? I feel like I've always identified as a writer since I can remember because I was writing letters to the editor when I was 11, 12, 13, and they were getting published in the New York Times and Vogue at my local paper. Oh my and God. It was about really cool. what? About everything. Like about, I wrote one about trying smoking. That was a response to an Anna <laughs> Quinlan column in the New York Times. And of course, like this is in, let's say 1995 when I was in high school. No, wait, I graduated college. I graduated high school in 1993. So it's more like 90, 91. This is before, you know, social media, internet. So this is like when my family would be reading these papers. And then in my local paper, I think I wrote about being pro-choice. And then this guy wrote in opposing what I wrote. And so, you know, it was sort of like the precursor to when people would like comment online, you know? Uh So I feel like pretty much always, like since I can remember. And then we'll get into this, but you went to law school, right? So it wasn't like a school. straight path. <laughs> What's funny is I was, I was not even 21. I was 20 when I started law school because I graduated college a year early. I was kind of, I don't know if you call it precocious, whatever, but I always was writing, like I wrote in college, like guest columns for the school newspaper. And then even in law school, I was at NYU law school, but I was writing these op-ed pieces for the you know, NYU paper. And so when I was applying to law school, I also thought about journalism school. So uh-huh. people said, oh, you have to do a lot of writing as a lawyer. I mean, not really true. Yes, you can be a lawyer writer, but the people I admire were lawyers who wrote books. Right. I just didn't know that there was a path to being able to write books or do other forms of writing for a living. It's much, it's a much more obvious path to go to law school, become a lawyer, uh-huh. make a salary versus like, no one really tells you that the way to make a living as a writer, at least the way I make a living is to do literally nine different jobs. I had to write them all on a list that's right in front of my <laughs> face because I have so many different jobs that I was like getting lost in like which one I'm doing when. And I think that's a much harder thing to explain to people that it's not just one type of writing you do usually to make money or to make enough of money to live on. No. Yeah. The artist's life is complicated to explain for sure. (laughs) What's your all-time favorite book? It's The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. I haven't reread it recently. I feel like maybe I should because I know she has a new novel coming out, but you know how sometimes you love a book so much you're afraid to revisit it? I mean, I guess you could say the same for a movie, but I just thought it was such a deep and empathetic and amazingly written memoir and I got the chance to interview her and that was one of my all-time favorite writing assignments I ever did she was so smart and we bonded over a lot of things and not that my life was exactly like hers but my father was an alcoholic Mm -hmm. and we had issues growing up and I just thought the way it was the writing but also the way she treated her parents and and was able to tell this what you could look at as traumatic story, but she didn't feel like it was traumatic. She felt like her parents did the best they could. And I think to a reader, it might seem like her parents maybe didn't do the best they could. Uh So I think she treated that tension really well. And I just, I love that book and I always recommend it. And now I think a lot of people have read it. Uh If you haven't read it yet, Glass Castle. (laughs) What's your dream writing routine? I'm always dreaming about going to some far off place and being at a writing retreat because I've Mm. never gone to one and it sounds so glamorous like you get up and you eat breakfast that someone else has made and you go for a hike and then you write until you're tired or you need to eat again and you're like at one with nature and by yourself (laughs) and there's no internet and the thing is I don't I don't know I I do want to try that someday like a long weekend writing retreat or maybe like one of these group writing events where you go and learn. I am going to a retreat. It's not a writing retreat, but it's in Palm Springs and it looks beautiful. And I'm sure we're going to do some writing. I'm really excited for that, but I I don't know how I would actually be in that scenario. 
like if I would get the millions of words, I think I would get written done in real life. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I know it does sound like a nice vacation though. What's your real writing routine? So my real writing routine is that I don't have any writing routine. Like every day is different. I work as a copywriter. I work as a freelance writer. I work as an editor. So, you know, there's always ideas that I have, at least right now. There were about two years during the pandemic where I pretty much felt like I had zero ideas and that sucked. I would rather have ideas percolating in my head and not not have enough time to write them or not have the ability to focus on them and at least know that they're lurking or that I've written them down on my like things to write list not having any ideas and I when I say not having any I mean it really felt like I had no ideas because I wasn't leaving my house nothing was changing the world was awful like that was such a terrible dark time and now I have so many ideas and you know some are essays some are articles some would be more involved where I have to interview a lot of people. So I kind of try to do the most urgent thing, like either something that's due or let's be real overdue. Sometimes <laughs> I have overdue things. If I know that it's somewhere that like, doesn't mind that much, not I'm all the, the time. Queen, Any I'm the queen of this, overdue. Hey, you no judgment here. <laughs> editors listen to this, please don't think I'm a terrible person. I just have that like procrastination fear of like, I want it to be perfect. So I try to either write the thing that's most due or overdue, but also the thing that feels like if I don't write it today, I'll lose my train of thought Uh and I'll lose that urgency. So I'm the kind of person who loves a new project. I start a lot of new projects. And so I'm inclined to want to work on the new project versus the old project that I've been working on for months that maybe I should have finished before. So usually if I have an idea for a new article or essay like that day, I'll do something on that. And Mm -hmm. sometimes if I can get out of my own way, I'll actually like pitch it or write the whole essay because I'm a pretty fast writer. I can write an essay usually in an hour or two, the draft anyway, but like, but it takes me, it'll take me a month or two months or longer to actually get to the point where I sit down and do that. So I've probably been thinking about it for much longer, but I have had an idea written an essay and sold it to the Washington Post in a morning but that's usually something maybe that is just, I'm super angry or fired up. Like if I'm writing about, I don't know, these conservatives and these book bans, I could probably knock that out in an hour. Cause I think about that every day. Cause there's news about it every day. Oh, that's amazing. So I, I don't trust myself. Even if I write something fast, I will like sit on it for long enough to be like, okay, you know, do I feel the same way or whatever, but you trust yourself to like submit it. Not always, not always at all. But I think the thing is I come around and then I second guess. Then sometimes the time passes, especially with like an op-ed. Oh yeah. You have to be fast. To the point where either it's not relevant or I see someone else has already written it. And once you see someone else basically writing the idea that you had enough times, I think it does motivate you to be more, quick about sending those pitches and yeah. it's funny because the worst that someone can say is no I always tell authors like there's just no feasible way I can accept everything that's sent to me as an editor but all that would happen is I say no and you can send it somewhere else or do something else with it but I see people who have great ideas like I'll encourage them as an editor or as a friend and they they can't pull the trigger and sorry that's probably like a poorly timed phrase but I couldn't think of a better one yeah. so so sometimes like when I see my own frustration with other people around that I'm like okay well why don't you write this essay because probably you could get it published because it's so weird or crazy or just bizarre like usually the things that I think of are aspects of my life that are if it's troubling me, like if it's something gnawing at me, it's probably going to be something that someone else is going through. Uh-huh. Totally. So, yeah. What's one piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it? I mean, this is a whole book, but Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. I just think it's so good because it's one of those writing books that applies to, I would say, anyone writing anything. Uh-huh. Like you can read it and pick it up and you don't have to start at the beginning. Like you can just open it and find good advice and it's the kind of advice that you're like that sounds basic and obvious but yet I need that advice 
Um, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and I love that. Like, I love that, that it's just like always applicable because even though I've published a lot, I've done a lot. I still have those fears. Like I will sit down and, and think to myself, either this is the worst piece of writing ever, or you're going to publish this and someone's going to hate you because uh-huh. not a stranger, but like someone in your life is going to hate you because you wrote this thing that, you know, mentions them not by name, but even, you know, they would see themselves in it. And then you start thinking along those lines and you can really talk yourself out of writing something. Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Okay. So you've edited more than 60. Is that right? More than 70 anthologies. Yeah. More than 70 anthologies of erotic fiction. I'm so curious about this. I want to know the origin story of how you got started probably writing it first and then how that turned into editing. They basically are connected in that I got started writing erotica when I was in law school and that was not going well. I just, (laughs) not that I was bored. I was just very outclassed in law school. Like I'd always gotten, if not straight A's, I'd done well in college and high school. I got to law school and had no idea what anything was like. It was just hard and confusing. And I was living in New York and I was like, oh, rather than try to actually learn these things that were complicated, I'm going to go to a million concerts. So like I went to concerts every night and thought I could study at one in the morning afterwards or cram it in. And you, you can't cram law school. I mean, maybe someone can, I could not cram law school. So uh-huh. law school was just, I felt so out of my element and then I'd go to class and it seemed like everyone knew everything. So meanwhile, I was going to concerts and going to sex parties and just enjoying nice. being 21, two, three years old in New York city. And at the same time, I was reading erotica and I'd never thought about writing fiction before. I had written these essays and letters to the editor and like very impassioned, like political diatribes. And this was different. Like these were stories that felt they were sexy, but they kind of felt realistic, partly because a lot of the early ones I read were billed as true stories. Uh And so I wrote a fantasy called Monica and Me, which was a fantasy about Monica Lewinsky and me for this book called Starfucker. And that was a book of celebrity erotica based on a zine. And that got accepted. And I can like still feel that excitement. And that was, (laughs) that was in, I wrote it in 1999 and it got published in 2000. So a long time ago, but it was so exciting to know that my name was going to be in a book. Like it felt totally different than being in a newspaper And then it also got accepted to Best Lesbian Erotica 2001, which is an annual erotica series by my publisher, Cleus Press. And so that one I actually saw first in a bookstore before I'd gotten my copies in the mail. And I cried, like I cried in the bookstore because it was, it was just so exciting. Like, you, I know I knew it was going to happen. It just, but it was different to see it. And I, can't tell you how gratifying it is now as an editor to be able to do that for other people and to see how excited they are to be in the books I edit it feels so full circle yeah and so I wrote that story and then I wrote a few more like I was writing them here and there when I saw someone was looking for stories about this or that and I wrote some erotica online a few other places and then around 2004 someone asked me to co-edit an erotica anthology and I did that and then kind of it just grew like other small publishers asked me to work on things and then I would sometimes do readings and through that I got at least one book deal and then I started working mainly with Cleus Press who I still work with and then we got into a rhythm of okay they would ask me what topics do you want to edit books about and the reason it's 70 in the last 23 years or since 2004 19 years is that there were years where I was publishing like six anthologies and I definitely don't recommend it. It was a huge <laughs> amount of work and I'm sure they cannibalized each other. Like, cause you know, people don't necessarily have the bandwidth for six erotica anthologies right. in one year. I don't know why I was doing so many. I guess I just thought, okay, they don't mind. They want me to. Okay. But now I do two to three a year and it's still, it's still a lot of work, but it's more manageable. Okay. So I have a lot of questions. Um, Monica and me, this is you and Monica hooking up. In I mean, the basically story. like, I mean, the character is was, Bill in the story. 
No, but well, so it's like I go to a, I think a book signing. I mean, I it's loosely, it's six. And narrator six, you. Like, yeah. Yeah. Narrator me who dresses like me and looks exactly like me. And has <laughs> uh, totally different. Narrator person, me though. goes to a, a book signing and we like hit it off. It That story was actually inspired by a tabloid story. And I can't remember if it was like the Inquirer or the Star, but there was a story around this time. I mean, 98 or 99 that said something like Monica Lewinsky had a crush on a woman in the White House who, I forget what she looked like. I think she was blonde. Like it basically hinted that what if Monica was bi? And I took that and kind of ran with it. And it was really fun. And it was just this innocent, not innocent, but it was just a lighthearted story among other stories about, I think there was one about maybe Brad Pitt or whoever in that book. And this could be a whole other podcast, but I wound up meeting a woman I dated for a year and I'm still friends with through that story because she came to a reading I was doing and said, did you write that Monica story? And she also had a crush on Monica. And so we bonded over that. And then, you know, we and then you guys started hooked dating. Up. And then we started dating. It's a very long story that is, I couldn't even summarize it if I tried, but we had a kind of traumatic breakup. And when we were going through these problems, Monica was living in this building in New York that it was kind of common knowledge that she lived there. And I don't know exactly to this day what it said, but she dropped a letter off at her building and Monica called her. So Your girlfriend? Yes. So Monica does know about the letter and then to bring this full circle. She knows, she, wait, she knows about your erotica? uh, Well, yes. Well, if she remembers, but then full circle, like five years ago or so, she was doing a speaking tour and I flew to Florida to hear her speak and me (laughs) and my ex-girlfriend went to see her. You guys are real fans. (laughs) So yeah, that happened. That all happened. And I have mixed feelings about it to this day, to be honest, because would I write that story now? I don't, I don't know. Because you know, I do feel like the story objectified her, but it was also, it wasn't about the real Monica, you know, it was about this fictional version of her and a fictional version of me. I mean, basically the book was celebrity fantasies, but you know, if you think about it from her point of view, you know, would I want to be a celebrity and have someone be writing basically fan fiction about me in a book? Like, I don't know if you get to pick. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it wasn't homage. It wasn't like, yeah, no, it sounds like she probably had more agency in your erotica than she did in real life. And I I, I even (laughs) said at the end, uh, first of all, I did research. I researched the exact club Monica lipstick that she wore (laughs) in her Barbara Walters interview that sold out. And I said something like, I know I could treat her better than Bill and (laughs) that married guy that she had a thing with like the four bill, like I said, I could treat her better than them. And I think to me, that sort of message, if there is one of that story is that these men really mistreated her. I'm not saying it wasn't consensual, but I do think they took advantage of her. And in my story, it was definitely a mutual affair. You know, it was a mutual fling and she enjoyed it. So, I mean, yeah, whether that's, like the ethics of like writing about a celebrity I don't know that's a separate topic but that is how I got started that story kind of put me on the map and it also gave me confidence I mean I'm not saying if it had gotten rejected I never would have written again but it for sure gave me confidence to know okay this editor and that other editor of these two books liked my story enough I didn't know them personally you know I didn't have a background in fiction I just wrote this story and sent it in and to me like that's one of the beauties of erotica specifically. I don't know how other genres work because I don't edit anthologies in other genres, but that's how it works now. Like when I'm editing an anthology, I put a call for submissions on the internet. People from all over the world send me stories and I pick the best ones. I don't look at, you have this degree or you've been published here. I mean, if you write mm-hmm. that, I'll, I'll read it, but that's not what I'm judging it on. I'm literally judging it on, does your story make sense for this book? Like, is it make me horny yeah does it make me horny is it good and also is it varied from the other stories that I want to include because sometimes I'll have two stories that are amazing like well-written sexy normally I would say yes but if they're both about mermaids and I only have room for 20 stories not everyone wants to read about mermaids so I would pick something else but usually in those cases I'll say to the second person hey I really liked your story but for various reasons I couldn't use it this time could I use it another time Uh uh-huh 
cool. Because I want to encourage people if the reason I didn't pick it was something they couldn't control. That's a very nice editor. So what happened with law school? When did you um, give up? <laughs> did you give up or did you the finish? Worst time. No, well, both. I didn't finish, but I was there for three years. So I had to pay three years of tuition. Oh, shit. Yeah. Don't ever do that. Like if you're in a situation, whether it's a job or especially if it's like graduate school that you're paying for, don't wait till the last minute to quit. I, I just was so paralyzed. I guess I didn't know. I didn't know how to leave like because I didn't uh -huh. know where I would live. I was living in the dorm. I was young. I was 23 by the end. I just didn't know what the alternatives were. Yeah. And so eventually the three years passed and I took a, a leave of absence officially, which I never went back. But that was how I had to do it in my mind to say it's a leave of absence versus, you know, cutting, cutting ties totally because I had just invested all that time and money. I, I think I really had no concept at 20 years old when I started what 150,000 in tuition and oh dorm God. fees yes. plus interest would actually look like in the real world, like how long it would take to make that while I was earning, let's say $40,000 a year at a job. Like it's just, I didn't have experience in the work world enough to realize, oh, I should have left after the first year, but I kept, I had that hope. And I think this goes back to what I said before, I had no vision for what an artistic life could be. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I knew writers like that I read books of, but I didn't know people like actual people who made a living writing. And even now, I think it's a little opaque. People think, oh, you just do this one thing. And I'm like, no, literally, I do nine different things. Yeah. And I think more people should talk about that. I actually like doing a lot of different things. I don't know if it's because I have ADHD or I just get bored, but I enjoy that. But not everyone wants to be hustling all the time and working definitely I definitely don't work nine to five I work like six to you know nine but not the entire time you know with breaks in between but I work right. weekends I work like I work when I'm on the toilet like I'm reading my email I'm not saying everyone has to do that but I do it because I just I do a lot of different things and there's always people contact me about them and I just like to be squared away before you know before the weekend or before I relax at night I like to catch up as much as possible yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I grew up in a small town and I don't really didn't really know anyone who was like a real artist, you know, aside from like a hobbyist. And it's helpful to know like how people actually put their budgets together and their all their different things. I feel like every artist I know is such a multi hyphenate. I want to follow up on writing about family you mentioned or writing about people, you know, has that become an issue before for you? So when I was in college, I wrote for Parade Magazine, that like insert that's in the Sunday paper. Uh -huh. I wrote a piece about my dad being an alcoholic. I have it somewhere, but I don't, I don't have it in front of me. So I don't know the exact headline, but it was something like my dad is an alcoholic. And I had my photo and I was 19 years old. And it definitely caused a little bit of a risk. Like some family members felt like that was inappropriate to write about. And my dad didn't have a problem with it, I think, because it was honest. And part of why I wrote it was because we had reached this impasse. He was actively drinking and I couldn't really communicate with him. And I felt like I was writing it to work that out. And I always say for me, writing is selfish. Like I wrote that primarily because I needed an outlet for that. And this again is, I can't do the math, but it was, it was a long time ago. So I got snail mail is my point. I didn't get email. I got snail mail letters from other young people who were in a similar situation. And that was so gratifying. And that taught me a lesson that when you write about someone, they're not always or necessarily the target audience. Uh -huh. It's other people like you. So now I write about my relationship sometimes. My boyfriend he'd be the last person to read a personal essay or a memoir. Like he reads fiction and uh -huh. he watches nature shows. Like that's just not, he doesn't watch reality TV. He doesn't, he does, he would never read a personal essay. I mean, unless uh -huh. like I said, read this or, you know, it, it's just, he's not the target audience. So I'll write something about our life. And he's like, why would anyone read this? And I'm like, oh, well, I read stuff like this every day. I, he just, I think there's just a different, type of person who would gravitate towards reading about other people's lives. But 
it's something I negotiate every time in my own mind. Like I ask myself, you know, are you writing this to get revenge on someone or to, right. to be unethical in some way? Or like, is it morally correct? Even though you can write about this, should you write about this? And that actually helps me in the writing because sometimes I try to take it a little bit, even though it's super personal, I take it a little bit out of my life and try to think about, okay, what is the bigger lesson here? Is this just about like the time I did this thing? Or is it really also about people who, you know, like when I write about myself as a hoarder, which I've written at least six or seven essays about that, it's about me being a hoarder, but I try to also explore the roots of that and demystify hoarding for people who think it's just about what you see on reality TV. Yeah, I agree. It's not for the person that you're writing about, but I think the revenge question is like the key question to writing about other people. If you're writing it with bad intentions, you should wait until you feel differently or can like take some of the blame because you're always have some sort of involvement in the situation and then write from a place of like generosity. But I think it's, I agree with that. I, I think it's okay to write about people who've mistreated you. And there's that famous oh, yeah. Anne Lamott line, like, you know, it, it's that if they wanted to be, oh yeah, they should have acted better. They should yeah. have acted better. Yeah. But I think you sort of have to ask yourself on a personal level and everyone might have different answers to this, what your motivation is and also what you get out of it. Cause I don't think any one publication, even if it's say modern love in the New York times, which is obviously a highly coveted venue. And yes, it's one of my highly coveted venues, but like, would it be worth losing an important relationship in my life to write for them? No. But if it's a relationship that is either past or that I've resolved or that the person would be okay with it. And I think if I'm being emotionally honest, then I feel, I feel safe writing it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the one person in my life that I'm like, just is like dead to me, who's still alive is the, an ex who was like abusive. And I wound up having an abortion, his abortion. And he was just like, whatever, read the essay. But anyway, that is a situation where like, you I'm like writing about I'm writing about it for like my former self who like really needed to understand that situation differently and like hopefully it helps someone like that and like he that's how I feel about him it's like he should have acted better <laughs> totally I have this utopian ideal that maybe some of those people might read those writings and <laughs> think, rethink their <laughs> actions probably that's not at all true but I guess part of me does hope that but I think ultimately you can't write for any one person unless it's right. yourself or your past self because for me the minute I start to think about you know would this person like this even if it's people I admire like my family members you know it, it gets in your head and yes they're entitled to their opinion I wrote an essay about bingo and money and gambling and I was really proud of it. And I send my writing to not my whole family, but definitely my grandfather who wrote a memoir and who I admire a lot. And oh, he basically cute. wrote back and was like, I have to disagree on this one. I'm worried that you're going to become a gambling addict because that's in our family and valid because my piece was about spending $2,000 playing bingo, but it was also <laughs> about how not in like a week, like, but it was about how I get enjoyment out of bingo. And I totally see why he had that opinion and he's entitled to that opinion. Right. I think the trick is if you're writing with your real name or under a pseudonym that other people know, like people are going to tell you what they think and they might be strangers who are, you know, just contacting you or they might be people in your life who you care about and you have to decide whether that's worth it. And sometimes people ask me, like students or or a fellow writers, like, should I publish this? And I don't think anyone can ever answer that for you. Yeah. Because like, I'm an editor, I'm starting a new essays publication, I'm not looking to exploit anyone or push them to write about something they don't want to write about. But once they say yes, I'm not going to take it down if they then say, Oh, well, right. this happened because of that, because that's a decision you have to make beforehand. I, t I totally agree with that. Okay. Let's talk about, I want to know everything about the process of putting these anthologies together. Like how often do you do book proposals? Where do you find contributors? What do you look for? I guess let's start there. Let's start with the book proposals. 
Okay, so now my book proposal process for the erotic anthologies is pretty simple. I just pitch an idea because I've done something so like 40 or 50 with the same publisher. So they kind of have a sense of, okay, we know she knows how to do it. Just is this idea viable? A lot of the ones I do now are variations of ones I've already done. So I had done a book called Orgasmic, which was women's orgasm erotica. And then we did the big book of orgasms, which was 69 very short like flash fiction stories about orgasms. Like we kind of look at the track record of them to determine what makes a, a, another book a good idea. So that book proposal process is pretty easy now, but in it later I can talk about a different proposal that I'm working on for a nonfiction anthology that's more of a traditional proposal. But so once I get a contract from them, the way I do the finances is they give me a flat fee for editing the book in my case, $2,500, and I work backwards and say, okay, that means I could pay about 20 people $100 each because I also have to buy copies of the book and mail them to them. So that costs a couple hundred. So I'm not really making any money up front when you take in uh -huh. 2000 for authors and the 300 ish for mailing. So I write a call for submissions. Mine are very long. They're about 2,000 words, and they include the contract terms. They include everything I want to see and everything I don't want to see and like literally exactly how to format it, how to write your subject line, how to write your bio, all the information I need. No matter how detailed I am, people always don't follow the directions. <laughs> and I'm very gracious. Like if you single space and I say double space, I'm never going to reject your amazing story because of that. But as a general rule, the people who don't follow the directions in pretty egregious ways, not that, but like who just ignore something that's in bold or is in the first sentence are generally not the writers that I would be picking anyway. It just right. kind of works out that way. Like they'll send something that's 10,000 words when I'm asking for one to 2,000 or something like that. Like just didn't even try. That's uh -huh. different to me than someone who sends 2,200 if my max is 2,000. Like then, okay, maybe... I would work with you to get it under 2000. I mean, don't do that if you're conscious of it, but if it's a genuine mistake or an error, fine. But like, you know, when it's clearly just like, here's a chapter from my book and that's been published for five years. And I said only unpublished stories, I just send a pretty blanket generic rejection. So I'll try to give myself as much time as possible. Like if my deadline to the publisher is September 1, I'll usually give the authors till maybe July one. So I have two months to edit and go back to them with questions or edits. And then also if by July one, I don't have everything I need, like if I have 80% of the stories, but there's 20% that I still want, I might extend the call for a month and say, okay, this is an extension. I'm only now looking for this subset of mm -hmm. types of stories. So, you know, I've learned over the years, I have to build in time for that because I like to write a call for submissions that's pretty widely interpretable because I don't want to say I only want stories about this one thing because then everyone will write about that and it's too narrow. Like I want mm -hmm. readers to have a lot of variety. That, that's my biggest priority to readers. I feel like people are reading my books who've never read erotica and then people are reading my books who've read tons of erotica and that's two different audiences that I have to cater to. Mm -hmm. So they're my first priority. Like, I don't want them to pick up the book, read the whole thing and feel like they just got the same story over and over. I don't want them to be bored. I want, I want variety in all kinds of ways. So I want different characters, like different ages, races, genders, settings, like city people, country people not all in the United States, not all in big cities, you know, not all able-bodied, not all thin, like just different personalities too. Like I don't want everyone to be a huge extrovert. Like I love a story about someone who's shy or socially awkward or something like that. I just want variety. And it's, it's hard because I tell people that they're like, yeah, but what do you really want? Like, what's the secret thing I could write that would get in? And I'm like, I can't tell you that. Like it's, it's a cliche, but I know it when I see it. Like if I start reading and I can't stop and I have ADHD, so I can almost always stop. Like I distract myself all the time. But if I start reading and I'm like, this is amazing. I want to know what happens at the end. And then I want to reread it again when I'm done. Then I know that's the kind of story I want to publish. And then what do you do for editing? How intensive is it usually? 
my edits are usually minimal. Like if I like the story, usually I tend to work with authors where my edits are maybe like, it's hard to give a percentage, but maybe like just minimal, like not nothing. Sometimes like I'll say edits. rewrite, yeah, line edits. Like sometimes I'll say, can you rewrite this? Usually I'll say, can you add more detail either to a sex scene or to another scene? Often that detail is about emotional detail. Like they will be detailed about the sex and the physical acts, but I'm like, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? That's uh -huh. the biggest note I give. I think just due to the time constraints of me not having weeks to spend with each story that works out that sometimes I like a plot but I don't have time to say rewrite the whole thing. I also feel awkward about saying rewrite the whole thing and maybe I'll publish it. Yeah. Like for me on a personal level, that feels sort of like I'm asking them, to, not sort of, it feels like I'm asking them to do work that may not come to fruition. And I don't really want to do that to a writer. So for that reason as well, I usually pick the stories that I'm 99% or 95% sure will make it in. Now, after that, and they do the edits and I edit, I turn it in and my publisher has final approval. So mm -hmm. I always am very upfront because some people are like, thanks for accepting my story. And I'm like, it's not accepted until I send you the contract. And even then the publisher might have minor edit requests. Now out of the hundreds or thousands of stories I've edited with them, I would say it's less than 10 that they've rejected. They rarely reject. Sometimes they come back with edit requests. Uh -huh. A lot of times those are around consent, like they want consent to be clearer, or sometimes they want, like in a recent one, they wanted us to take out name brands or name. They didn't want us to use real life TV oh, networks. Yeah. They wanted us to fictionalize them. So, which I didn't think it was that big of a deal in those cases, but we did. You know, and I, I came always... all over these McDonald's fries. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> wow. I love that your mind went to this. <laughs> but, um, you know, I always tell the authors, it's your option. Like, you don't have to take these edits. It's just we can't publish it without these changes. And sometimes they say, you know what? I don't want to make all these changes. Sometimes it's around age. Like, for my oh. book, you have to be 18 or older throughout the whole story. And sometimes there's flashbacks to childhood or someone is right on the edge of like they're 17 and about to turn 18. And I'm like, well, if you make them 18 throughout the story. And sometimes people argue with me, like someone said to me, well, I live in Europe and, you know, the age of consent is lower and we don't have that. And I feel like I'm pretty clear about what my rules are. And there aren't many things you can't do in my books, but also it's very easy to publish an anthology. Anyone can do it. There's self-publishing. There's so many means to publishing now that if you feel strongly about something that my books don't cover, you can write your own or edit your own. Yeah. I'm not a gatekeeper in the traditional sense. Like, yes, I'm a gatekeeper in the sense that I'm editing this particular book and only have room for this many stories, but no one is stopping someone else from doing the exact same thing. Totally. So how does the dollars and cents work out at the end? Like, do you make money on the back end? So some I do, some I don't. It, it's basically based on royalties. So, you know, I make whatever per book. I think it works out, let's say about a dollar a book. So I have to make $2,500 back to earn back my advance. Usually that'll take at least a year or two. Sometimes it takes a little bit less because I have so many books, like it all I don't always analyze every single one individually. Like I get a big statement with over 40 line items. And I can tell you there, I get quarterly royalties. Now some I get every other, like biannually. So, cause it started out quarterly and then later contracts switched to twice a year. There have been times when I've made almost 20,000 a quarter, like in the 18,000 range. Oh, and then nice. there've been, there been times when that same quarter, I mean, another quarter, I've made less than $2,000. So oh. it pretty much ranges within that. I mean, usually it's not going to be like 18, one quarter and two the next. It's going to be more similar. Like if it's 10, it might be eight the next time or something, but it's really totally unpredictable. It's my point. So I can't rely on that for my income like that, that I consider extra income because I really have no idea like if it's 5,000, I'm happy to take $5,000, but that only goes so far. Like that's, you know, what, like 
two months of my expenses or something, you know, yeah. if it's 15,000, then it could go into savings and could go for more things. So I have learned over the years that I can't rely on that income to like, I, n- I don't earmark it for certain bills because I just don't know how much it will be. Yeah. Um, I wish I did. Like, I wish it was more predictable after 50 shades in 2012, 13, 14, it was a lot higher. Like there was a boom. Now it's a bit oh. lower. So it's, it's been all over the map. You know, I have like personal goals, like when it was up like way high, I was like, Ooh, maybe I should make goals. And it's like, I'd love to get hit at like 20,000 quarter or 25,000 quarter. And then it, it just went down from there. Now, maybe someday it'll go back up. Like there's been a few foreign editions. I think I've only sold, my books have only been translated into German, never other countries. That's, that's a personal goal. I'd love to see a book of mine translated into Spanish because that's actually a language I oh, yeah. can speak a little bit. It is super cool to see a book of mine in German uh-huh. and I get a, like a lump sum. It's not that much. Maybe it's a thousand dollars or something. It's not like enough to change my life, but it's still like extra nice. money for doing yeah. nothing. But I've been told that foreign translations are better for full novels than the short stories. So I don't know if that's the case, but that is what I've been told by some publishers or by some foreign publishers. So do you have an agent that helps with this or do you all do all of this independently? So like I both have an agent, but for other books and then this I do on my own because it's it's such small, like it's $2,500 advance. I, I wouldn't want to give 15% of that to an agent. Now I'm not saying other people shouldn't. I'm just saying for me, totally for a deal like this. And it's an that, established relationship that you set up yeah. yourself. Right? And I never, I never used an agent for this. I've used an agent for other like bigger deals, like with, with, with another publisher, Steel Press for like those, I did two anthologies with them and I got $8,000 advance. I did two books. One of them never sold out the advance and one did. So those, I get some royalties, but again, it's, you know, sometimes it's been, let's say low four figure. And sometimes it's like less than a hundred dollars. So, you know, I treat all of that as just extra money, like the same way, you know, I write sometimes on medium.com, like, and sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll get a little money like deposited in my account. I'm like, okay, great. But I no longer rely on that. There was a time when I would plan my finances around, okay, I'm getting this quarterly check because they were always, I I actually remember they were always at least five figures. And I know this because for over 10,000, I had to go to deposit the bank, the check in the bank physically versus Uh on mobile. And I I switched banks to be able to uh, have a higher (laughs) limit. And then right when I switched banks to have a higher limit, they started being less than, 10,000. So, but, but then my publisher switched to direct deposit. So it doesn't matter. But my point really is that for me, it's all over the map. So like there's been years when for a long time, book royalties were the bulk, like the biggest item on my income. Like I made the most doing that. And then other work I did, I made less annually, but now that has changed and it's not the biggest income generator for me. It's high, but it's not the biggest. So promoting these, I would think, I mean, you have all these contributors, like 20 contributors, you sort of have like an army of PR people, or you should, or are people not that great about promoting them? You know, it depends. Not all 20 are all going to be at the same level of promoting or have the time or interest. Some are not on social media. Some aren't on social media as their pen name because I would say like at least 80% oh, yeah. or more of people writing erotica are using a pen name. I see nonfiction anthology editors of other types of books that aren't in the sex field getting more traction around getting everyone to promote their books. Or like I've seen YA ones where they'll have a website with everyone's photo and bio. So I think in some ways, because it's erotica and it's sex, it's harder to get them promoted but then on the other hand it's catchier like mm-hmm. for, for in some venues like I've been able to get bookstore readings when I want them not everywhere but like for the first five years of best women's erotica of the year I did in-store readings at bookstores in DC and LA and Chicago and New York and those weren't that hard to negotiate I think it's partly because I had not just me and I have a bit of a following but I, I wasn't just bringing my following I was saying it's me plus 
three or four other authors. Mm-hmm. So I think you, you can leverage that. And especially if they're new to publishing, they're probably more enthusiastic. Like if it's their 50th anthology, their friends are probably like, well, I've seen you read before. Like, who cares? I mean, not all of them, but you know, it's not as novel. Whereas if they've never done a reading before and it's their first reading, they're probably going to bring more people to the event. So I didn't do any events during the last few years because of COVID, any in-person. I did some online and I have mixed feelings because it's great for me. Like when I lived in New York, it was easy for me to get around and do readings in New York. I live in the suburbs in New Jersey. I'm two and a half hours from New York. It's just more of a pain for me to get to places and it costs money and time. But I'm considering doing some readings in December or next February for Valentine's Day, partly inspired by one of my authors, Jane Boone. She had a novel come out during the pandemic, so she didn't get to do in-person events. And we met up and she has a story coming out in a December 2023 anthology, Best Women's Erotic of the Year, Volume 9. And she said, I'd love to do an event. And I said, okay, let me see who's interested. And actually, I have, I have a dozen authors who are interested. That's too many for one event. So I might do, I might do two. And you asked about money before. I don't make money on an event like that because I mean, even if I lived in the same town, probably the most books I would sell is 20 if I'm lucky. Like right. I, people are not flocking there to buy the book necessarily, but I've had a reading where we got our photo then in library journal. Like they're a good PR opportunity yeah. to get your book listed in like Time Out New York, if it's New York or LA Weekly or wherever. And then just to spread the word about the book, I think people might hear about it or they might see it on display at a bookstore, you know, coming soon or this week as this is happening and they might pick it up even if they can't make the live event. So there's definitely reasons to do events, but it's not like you're going to make back the money and time you're spending on it. It's not so calculated as that. I think do a reading if you want to do a reading and enjoy that kind of energy and it's a nice thing for the authors like to meet each other in person mm-hmm. it's nice for me to meet them in person because otherwise mostly I just email with them totally but online events are also cool because you can have people all over the world joining you and then you can have readers and listeners who would not who don't live in New York or LA or wherever can enjoy those events for free from their own home and feel included in that so I think there's benefits to both types of events. So what have you found to be the most effect? I mean, 70 anthologies, what has worked the best as far as book promotion? In terms of direct sales, I would say media hits. Like I was once interviewed at Slate and they linked to one of my books and I saw an uptick. It's hard for me to say exactly because like I don't always, I can't really tell the exact trajectory of like what happened and then which book sold. But in terms of general promotion, I think media, I think podcasts, there's some erotica podcasts I've been on. And I think people remember hearing or, or, or an interview podcast, but people remember either hearing you on the podcast or they remember hearing someone read your erotica. And I think for erotica specifically, audio is huge. Mm-hmm. Like my audiobook sales, have taken off in the last a little more than 10 years, maybe 12 years. I mean, I don't have exact figures, but I know that they started to overtake ebook and print on some of my books. And there was a while where I would say maybe 70% of my royalties were coming from audio. And that was when I was making like a lot. So it was many thousands of dollars every quarter on just audio, which was amazing. And it's leveled off a little, but it's still for some books really high. Yeah. Audio erotica is definitely a good match and having a boom for sure. So let's talk about, you wrote a whole book about how to write erotica, but let's do like a little mini tutorial. Obviously people need to get the book for the deep dive, but what would be some tips for how to get started? Okay. Now I just can't stop thinking about someone coming on the McDonald's fries. So (laughs) I might have to use that as an example. I mean, first, I think, you know, find something you want to write about. There's prompts in my book, and some of them are really basic. Like, literally, I can see your living room, so I see these chairs. One of my prompts is write erotica set in a chair or about a chair, and that could be a bar stool. It could be a 
office chair, it could be any kind of chair. And I like that prompt because usually people are writing about sex in a bed or some other setting. They're not usually writing about a chair and probably for two people to have, let's say intercourse in a chair might be awkward, but there's tons of other things you can do in a chair. Someone uh-huh. could be tied to a chair. I've written several restaurant stories where someone is sitting in a chair and something is happening either above the table or below the table. There's just like <laughs> so many things you can do. And I think you could apply that prompt to almost any piece of furniture or any room in your house. Like you could say, okay, I'm going to write erotica set at a desk or in the bathroom or on the roof or in the basement or the attic and you know just play with that or if you already have an idea in your head like you saw something on the news about I don't know a celebrity or you saw just something or you overheard something I mean I've written stories just based on a subway ad there was this tv show necessary roughness and it was, I think, oh my God, I was show. a writer's assistant on that. Are you show. serious? Yeah. Okay. So I never saw it and I actually don't really know what it's about, but it's a football term, right? Yeah. So I wrote a short story called Necessary Roughness. I'm going to send you that book. <laughs> That's so funny. I just thought, what a perfect erotica story title. I don't have to know what this is about in real life to write an erotica story based on this. So I love like eavesdropping on people's conversations and picking up like a phrase or just a snippet and I'm not saying go eavesdrop and like write down that person's life or go on set life and like copy someone's life story don't do that but you can definitely get inspiration from like literally anywhere I mean you go on Twitter you go on on set life or on any dating site and like I mean, I'm not on dating apps because I'm in a long-term relationship, but if I was and I was like, oh, well, I'm not going to swipe. This is embarrassing. I don't even know which is left or right, like which is the right, (laughs) a good one, a bad one. But if I'm not going to like say yes to that person, maybe like they could prompt an erotica story. You don't, you don't have to tell them. I mean, you don't really know that much about them anyway, but maybe just like something about their photo or their profile. You're like, I'm going to try to eroticize it right on you. Yeah. Yeah. Or or take headlines like (laughs) Donald Trump's indictment. I mean, maybe someone's having like an indictment party and they're like, every time he says indicated you beat someone or something. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Like Stormy's revenge erotica. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Well, if you go on Amazon, there are a lot of, I'm sure there's Trump, but there's other, I I can't think off the top of my head, but like every election cycle, there are. Oh, I bet. And that actually is reminding me, speaking of publicity, this site is no longer online, but for a very brief moment in time, I had a website called Sarah Palin Erotica and it Ah. was uh, (laughs) like fan fiction about her because sort of like, not that she's like Monica, but she was someone who people were just intrigued by. And I was intrigued by just how ridiculous she was. And I thought it would be an opportunity to sort of make fun of that within an erotica context. I, I think I took it down because I was worried about like the secret service coming after me or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm pretty sure that if you wrote fan fiction about someone very famous, and it was good enough, you could get attention for that. There's a famous story called Courtney Cox's Asshole. That, what? Uh, actually, it's written by the writer now known as Joey Soloway, but it's it's online somewhere. Oh, it's, really? It's, it's, tell me, tell me about it. It's been so long since I read it, but like, it's about, I think a woman whose job is bleaching Courtney Cox's Asshole, <laughs> I think. Like, look it up, because it's, it's online, but- that story helped put them on the map, I think, like in, in some writing circles. So I'm not saying everyone should be writing erotic <laughs> fan fiction, but I think it also, you really have to ask yourself, like, is it coming from a genuine interest in the person? Because I always think that will come across, whether you're writing celebrity erotica or whatever it is, when you're starting out, especially, don't pick a fetish to write about that you hate or you know absolutely nothing about unless you have access to like research about it. Like I've written about fire eating and that actually scares me. Like I've seen it in person and I'm fascinated by it, but I actually find it terrifying and I would never eat fire myself. But that pushed me to try to write about it because I wanted to know what that was like. And I had to 
do a lot of research to find out how do you put out a fire in your mouth without burning yourself and then make that sexy. So don't try something super complicated like that your first time writing erotica. Like generally I would say use a fantasy of yours or an interest of yours. Even if the real life interest isn't sexual, you can eroticize it for your fictional purposes. Or you can also take like a terrible experience. You know, maybe you've been waiting online at the DMV for three hours and you want to like punch someone and you're just like, ah, is it even worth it? Like, do I need my license? But maybe you can eroticize like people hooking up at the DMV. Nice. Yeah. That I would, would say just go start, faster. Yeah. Start with something in front of you or something in your life that you're already thinking about and then see what happens as you start writing. Like you don't have to know everything that's going to happen right away. Yeah. I would think you would want to start from a place of what turned you on because that's the whole genre is turning people on. So like, yeah. it seems like write what you know. <laughs> I, I would say write what you know at the beginning and then you can definitely branch out. I think it's going to be just much harder to write about something you hate or that yes. like, turns you off. I think that's different than writing about something that maybe you're neutral on. So, you know, I, I don't think you have to choose the thing that's the most challenging to start, like choose something relatively in your wheelhouse and then see what happens. Do you mostly, um, like how erotica works in your personal sexuality? Are you like discovering new things through your writing that you like would want to try or are you like exploring the fantasy through the writing and then you're like I don't even need to try this or do you know what I'm kind of getting yeah, I know at? what you're saying I would say in the past I have I've definitely written about things that I was curious about or that I, you know I'd heard about and wanted to explore and sometimes those are things that weren't conscious like I wrote a story about a professional submissive and there was daddy play and I was like that's weird because that's not actually my personal fetish but writing the story really turned me on and I think those can be two different things you can be very into the fantasy of your fictional story and be like this written down is hot but I don't actually want to try that or it uh -huh. could be the opposite where writing it down makes you realize that you want to try it I would say now my erotica is more I wouldn't say it's more cerebral, but it's more maybe theoretical. Like it's not uh -huh. directly related to my personal sex life. But I think that's partly because I've been doing it for so long. I've written so much inspired by my own life, like either loosely veiled. Like I wrote about my first lap dance, the story called Lap Dance Plus. Um, and that is another story that I'm going to say is 100% true. I mean, it's set at Cheetahs in LA and it's like <laughs> me getting a lap dance and the woman told me, this is so long ago now, I don't remember what year, but it's probably 20 years ago. She told me about a celebrity who had come in. I did not name that person in the story, but I, I just dictated what happened. But it, actually, that's not true. I didn't dictate what happened. I think that's another misnomer about especially erotica, but also other fiction. People think you just write down what happened and you're done. Uh -huh. It's actually really hard to write a fiction about your own life because you're always choosing bits and pieces to include and you're massaging the details and you're using like the craft of writing to tell a story. And I'm going to actually say that applies to essays too. People also think, well, it happened to you. So you just sit down and write it and you're done. And it's super challenging to write an essay. Partly, I think because it happened to you. So, you know, everything that happened before, everything right, that happened right. after, there's so many details you could put in and you're like, which one are relevant and what is the actual heart of what I'm trying to say so it's not always as simple as write what you know but if you have had a momentous sexual experience I, I think don't feel beholden to all the real details like it can have happened the way you write it but the character it happens to might not be you uh -huh. what are your favorite pieces of erotica that other people have written like classics or uh, maybe not classics yeah. maybe they're more obscure they're not like classic classics, but there's a book I always recommend. I love it. It's called Secret S-E. It's like the S dot period dot E dot period, et cetera, by mm -hmm. L. Marie Adeline. It's a trilogy, but the first one is amazing. They're all good, but 
I loved it because it's this erotic romance, but it's really more on the erotica side about this woman who her life is going horribly, like she's very down on her luck and this other group of women swoop in and are like, we're gonna fulfill your top sexual fantasies, write them down <laughs> and we will make them happen. And she doesn't know exactly how they're gonna make them happen and the reader doesn't either, but they do. And it's so hot. There's a scene, I think in the second one where this woman goes into the cockpit of a plane and like does stuff with the pilot, but she's also scared of flying. Like, I think <laughs> why I like it is that the sex is super hot, but it's also literally these women's fantasies coming true. And you're like, that's exactly why people read erotica. So that I one it. I love. I love Katrina Jackson. I mean, I've read various books of hers. She's a great author, but the ones that surprise me the most are that she has this mafia romance series and I don't read mafia romance the violence freaks me out like usually I'm not going to be reading a mafia romance because I was already a fan of hers I thought let me try her mafia romance and it's really sexy <laughs> like you, I got sucked into the mafia and even though yes you know this man's job is basically being a hitman you're like oh but he's a sexy hitman yeah so those two I like there's an literary novel that is not erotica but has some of the sexiest writing I've ever read it's called a concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers oh. I don't know how to say the author's name but it's x-i-a-o-l-u-g-u-o and I just found it at a bookstore a long time ago in London and it's about a woman who moves from rural China to London and is learning English throughout the course of the book and at one point she goes to like a, a peep show or like a I don't think it's a strip club. I think it's a peep show. But so she's describing the women she sees and how sexy they are, but in language that works for her. So she says things like her flower. Whereas if I was reading like a modern erotica book by a native English speaker who was like, oh, her flower, I'd be like, oh, that's so cheesy. But in that context, it totally works. Um, oh, so. interesting. So those are like three that I recommend. I remember being a kid and being like, so reading my mom's copy of Bridges of Madison County and being like, so turned on. <laughs> I love that. I think like anything can be sexy if it's, if you're in the mindset, not anything, but like if you're in the mindset for that, and especially if you haven't read a lot of sexy things and you read one sexy thing and like, Ooh, yeah, yeah totally as a teenager. So what's next for you? What are you working on? Anything that you can share? So a lot of what I'm working on is nonfiction, although I am editing two erotica anthologies. One is flash fiction of 1000 to 1200 words. And I have room for 69 stories. Those I've done a bunch of them and they're really fun because I think they generate submissions from newer authors who are like, well, I don't know if I can write a longer story, but I can write something short and it's just fun to read such a wide variety of stories mm -hmm. so that one will be out next year I'm doing volume 10 of best women's erotica of the year that will also be out next year and I'm working on my own short story collection of erotic stories from the Monica one and then up to now and a few new ones so I'm pulling my favorite of the old stories and writing some new ones and that's kind of trippy to realize it'll be 25 years when the book comes out like 1999 to 2024 and that is a weird feeling because like I'm 47 but I don't always feel 47 but when I look back I'm like oh this is a big body of work uh, yeah and then can I say one more thing I'm yeah. launching an essay publication called open secrets it's on Substack opensecrets.substack.com and we're going to publish a new personal essay every Monday. I put my own money into this. I'm putting $2,600 in to publish the first 26 essays and then hopefully there'll be more if people subscribe and pay. But I just, I love essays. That is probably the thing I would read all day, every day, like a memoir, but aside from fiction, which I also read, but I love just the personal essay form. I think mm -hmm. you can get to know this side of someone that often is not something they would share with you if you just met them in person. Now, maybe if you hit it off and they became your friend, but I love getting this peek into someone's life, something that you wouldn't know about otherwise. And they're so personal. Like, I don't want to give away too much, but one is about parenting and grief. One is about a woman who had a stroke and she's a romance novelist. So how that 
affected her life. And we're going to have ones on relationships and addiction and health and career. And I don't know, because I'm still sorting through or people are still pitching me, but I'm really excited. So I, I just hope people will subscribe. And I, I hope that like lots of interesting writers will send me their essays. Yeah, it's such a cool idea. And Substack is a fun place to experiment. I don't know. I've been having a good time on Substack. What's on your bucket list? Well, one big thing on my bucket list is to edit an anthology that is not erotica or sex related, like is on another topic, like a nonfiction anthology. And I'm actually working on a proposal for one that I don't want to give too much away because it's very Mm -hmm. loose form, but, and, you know, would I love to turn open secrets into a anthology? Yes. Like to me, like that would be super cool. Oh, I like, can see it. I, I've learned a lot from anthologies like that and publications that people publish first person essays. I don't know if you ever read Fresh Yarn that uh, uh, Hillary Carlip edited. It's a site, freshyarn.com. It's still around. There are some amazing essays up there and like getting to write for them was such a highlight of my career back however long ago. Elise Miller wrote an essay about I want to say Depeche Mode. I, I, I'm so bad when I quote about things from a long time ago. I'm like, wait, was it about Depeche Mode or was it about a different band? I'm pretty <laughs> sure it was about Depeche Mode. There, there's amazing essays up there that are that are all still there. This just hasn't published in recent years. But to me, like what I hope Open Secrets will be is a sort of a modern version of that. People keep wanting more advice and more specifics about what to write about. They're like, well, can you tell me like, do you want something salacious? Do you want it this you want it you know like dark and deep and I'm like whatever you want to write about like as long as it's personal and powerful and interesting I'll consider it cool I guess is there anything else that you want to say before we go into the postscript this has been great you've got such a wide body of work the only thing I'd say is like if you're curious about writing just write it sounds so obvious but I think it is very hard for people to get started because especially with erotica, but also with essays, there's so many doubts people have, like what will people think or what will it say about me if I write this or what could it do to my career? I mean, you're always going to have those questions, but writing it on your own personal computer or in a notebook is not going to hurt any of those issues. Like, Just the act of writing, even if you never show it to anyone, I think changes you. And in my experience, usually changes you for the better. So I would say just start with the writing and then you can always edit it or ask Mm -hmm. questions about it or figure out what to do with it later. But I don't think you're ever going to regret writing something. Yes. Publishing it, publishing it, you might like, (laughs) I I can't, I've regretted (laughs) publishing things, but writing, I've never regretted having written something down. (sighs) That's so funny. What's one piece of writing advice you wish you could give your former self? Definitely just do it anyway. Like I was given an opportunity to write for an anthology that Erica Zhang was editing (gasps) and it was paying a thousand dollars. What? And I I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to tell this story because I come (laughs) off really poorly But I wrote a draft. I think I got in my own way, like I just said, like, because the prompt was the best sex of your life. And I was dating someone, but I wasn't writing about sex with them. So it felt awkward. Like, what if they're going to read it and be like, oh, well, who is this about? And it was about someone sort of known in the literary world. So I was worried that I wasn't disguising that person well enough. And anyway, I wrote a draft. I sent it in. I got edits back. And then I just panicked and, like, never wrote it. And to this day, this is a while ago, I, I regret it because that was so stupid. Not only did I lose out on a thousand dollars and this chance to work with Erica Zhang, but like, what was I so afraid of? And I don't know, but I was afraid. And so my advice to myself would be to just do it anyway and not to write something that you don't feel comfortable with or put your name on something that's too revealing, but just don't second guess yourself because I've second guessed myself out of many other opportunities too. It might look like I've published a lot, but trust me, when I like lie in bed in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about not those bylines, <laughs> but I'm thinking about all the things that I could have had that like opportunities I was offered that I did not finish. <laughs> That's a good tip. Okay. One tip for writers trying to get a book published. Publish short pieces. 
like essays, stories. And even if you're trying to get a novel published, like you can publish essays that are maybe about something semi-related to your novel. Like if your novel's about father-daughter relationships, you could write about your father or whatever, but you never know who's reading those because I've had people remember essays I've written many years later uh, because it was either about like a hoarding essay I wrote. I mean, people remember, or I wrote about sleeping in separate beds from my boyfriend. They'll remember, and it doesn't have to be directly related to your book. It's just about getting your name out there because we're all bombarded with, you know, so many things we could be reading or people we could be following. So I think the more it's kind of like a numbers game, like don't they say you have to see something seven times before uh -huh. you'll buy it? So people have to see your name over and over to remember you. And you never know which thing will hit with an editor or with a publisher or an agent. So I think just start short because also that's more manageable. I'm not going to say, yeah, just write five novels in your spare time, but you could write five essays over five months, let's say. Totally. What's your all-time favorite piece of your own writing? Okay. This was a re <laughs> really hard one. <laughs> I'm not sure, but it might be that hoarding essay. I wrote it for Salon and emotionally, I'm not saying it's the best written piece, but emotionally it was the hardest one to write about. Like a lot, for a lot of people writing about sex is hard like that. Like they don't want to be revealing about their personal life. I've uh -huh. never had a problem with that, but coming out and showing photos of my apartment as a very active hoarder was scary. And for me, looking back, I'm really proud that I did it anyway, because I got so much support. I mean, no one said anything worse to me than I'd ever thought about myself. And it was so freeing and cathartic to just have it out there. And sometimes people would say to me, oh, you're, you're probably just messy. You're not really a hoarder. I'm like, no, I'm really a hoarder. Like on TV, like, I mean, you, you might not see it by looking at me. I look put together and I look normal, so to speak, but I'm a hoarder and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And like, once you saw the picture and read the essay, like you also knew that I was a hoarder. Yeah. And that's what they're supposed to do. Right. This has been awesome. I'm so glad. I feel like I I don't I was trying to think of how I knew of you originally, but I couldn't. I just feel like I've <laughs> I've like known of you for a long time and I couldn't even put my finger on it. <laughs> so I'm glad we finally got to do this is my point. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm a big fan of the show, so I was excited to be on. Yay. Um how can listeners connect with you online? You can visit my website, rachelkramerbustle.com. I have a substack, rachelkramerbustle.substack.com. You can find the best women's erotica series, dweoftheyear.com. I'm on Instagram, Rachel Kramer Bustle. I'm on social the most at Twitter, at Raquel Lita. And also visit opensecrets.substack.com and please subscribe. And every Monday we'll be posting a new episode. Yay.